All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Chris Stone. I'm the director of Boone County Arboretum. I'm Ellen Crocker. I'm an assistant professor of forest health extension at the University of Kentucky. And we also have Josh Selm here. He's our curator at the Arboretum. He will be at the helm of our Zoom um, operations there. So if you have a chat question, he'll help us uh, make sure that we catch it. Yeah, and so our program today was kind of a, a brainstorming session between the two of us um, in that I know you do this series of different presentations and you and I got to talking one day and, and came up with this idea about So that's always an interesting topic. You know, what are the easiest native plants? Aren't native plants all easy to grow? The answer is not always. So just looking at each state, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and this tri-state area, we all have very different ecosystems. And especially in Kentucky, you get a lot of acidic eastern forest species in the Appalachian mountain areas. And they like really nice acidic loam soil, which we don't have here in this part of the state. So. Uh, some of those native plants from those acidic areas will not do very well here. And I think there's also, you know, challenges with native plants in that a lot of our non-natives, especially if they're tried and true garden plants, we know how to grow them very well. You know, you can look online and find all of the information about how to grow them perfectly in your garden setting. Um, and some of our natives, you know, they might grow great, out on their own, but then if you try to bring them into that setting, it might just be really different. And so our goal today is to walk you through a selection of different native species that maybe effortless is a little bit of an oversell, maybe not effortless, but with minimal effort can thrive. Um, so we're going to talk and it's hard to narrow it down, right? We have hundreds of different native species that would be fabulous selections. I think probably I have in my tiny little garden already. I'm a collector. I don't follow any of the things I'm going to tell you today, uh, especially I like to have them all. I like one of each in my garden, which is not a very aesthetically pleasing way to garden, but nonetheless. So today our challenge was we only have an hour together. How are we going to cover all of the amazing natives you should have in your, your garden and your landscape. Um, so instead, we pared it down to 15, which was a challenge for us. You should tell them how many I had in the original. <laughs> I had 126 we, slides with about 80 different plants. Yeah. And we had to chop it down to this. And that's painful for me. I just <laughs> I talk fast and I just can roar through a list of plants. So this was this is fun today to have to tamper me down on my list. <laughs> so it's just the tip of the iceberg, I think it is very safe to say that we're not going into depth about, you know, the diversity of different native plants you could be using. Um, but five trees, five shrubs, five perennials that we thought were just, you know, excellent choices in terms of what they do, but also in terms of their ease of growth. And so hopefully that'll get us talking about some other things too. And if you have questions about others, we can talk about those. And um, we're also gonna talk about some tips for success when gardening with natives, how to find these native plants, because that's a little trickier, especially if you're new to the easiest um, forest plant growing species, you can just go to the closest store to you and they'll have a whole assortment. But once you start focusing on natives, it can be a little bit more challenging to source those. And we'll talk about that, but very possible. And then I think we're gonna get outside. We are. Which is great today because it's still pretty nice out there. And I hear there's some things. And snow, a little bit of snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for spring, but I'm ready. <laughs> All of it or just for me? I think mine keeps dropping. I don't know why, but there we go. Now it's back. Hopefully. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and sorry to those of you joining on Zoom, but, but let me know if that happens again. Um, so we'll be able to talk about other favorite natives and tricky scenarios um, when gardening with native plants. How many of you here are already passionate native gardeners, native landscapers? 
Yes. One of these. Okay, one of these. Excellent. How many folks are kind of like testing the waters today? Haven't really gotten into this, but are curious to see what it's all about. Excellent. For all of you, welcome. I'm delighted to be meeting you. And I'm especially delighted to be working with Chris today because he is a phenomenal resource. And not only is he a phenomenal resource, but so is the Arboretum. And I think, you know, I'm going to mention this again, but if you're curious about it, you know, you can go to everybody's gardens and see how your hostas and daylilies and uh, um, taxis and boxwood should look. Um, but Arboreta are amazing places for seeing a greater diversity, for kind of testing things on in your mind, new species you're interested in. Um, that you might not be able to pick up as easily in other gardening resources. So I uh, just want to mention that right off the bat. We plan a little bit of everything. Uh, we push the boundaries of what may and may not grow here very well. And so um, if you got to the Arboretum, you can see things are doing really well and things are kind of uh, maybe more iffy. Yeah. And, and maybe you like the challenge. And that's fine too, but <laughs> it's good to be aware of that going in. And I'll mention some of my challenges and my, my landscape adventures as well. And I'm sure we'll see some today. Yeah. So to start us off, we wanted to talk about five great native trees. And there are way more than five. Uh, Kentucky alone has 120 plus native species. And if we were to look at our greater region, it would be even more. Now are all of those native right here? to this part of Kentucky? They are not. No. They're not. <laughs> You'd be pretty <laughs> sorely disappointed, as you mentioned, to plant some of our more Eastern species here. Could it be done? You can, but it takes a lot of effort. So sourwood is one of the first trees that you think of. A beautiful Eastern forest native, but loves nice, well-draining acidic loam. So we have planted many a sourwood at the Arboretum in different spots, and they always die. They last about five years, and that's about it. I was tempted. Oh, I dropped again. I was tempted by sourwoods this past year, and I bought some for my landscape. But what I'm going to have to do is, you know, I'm in a limestone area, so I'm going to need to amend that soil on a pretty regular basis to make sure the pH doesn't venture too far out of the range of the sourd. Is that effortless? No. Are they beautiful? Yes. Do I love them? Yes. Are they on this list? No. No, we are, we are giving you the, the ones that we think will be the most uh, happy in your landscape setting. So to start us off, oaks. This isn't a species, right? <laughs> no, it's a group of plants, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is a big group. I mean, this is huge. And not all oaks, but as a group, when we're talking about using native plants in your landscape, I mean, we can't help but start with oaks, right? Oaks That's right. are a great starting place for a number of reasons. How many of you already have oaks in your landscape? All right, so this is not new per se. They're fabulous street trees, fabulous yard trees, not just for shade, but for lots of different things. I mean, I think of oaks as these powerhouses when it comes to insects that they support. A single oak might support hundreds of different species of insects. And these aren't things that you really have to worry about hurting the health of your tree. No, no, these are things that might cause a little bit of damage, but are you know, used to growing with those oaks. And those insects will feed birds and, feed, you know, other wildlife will be supported by acorns. Um, and that's one of the things I love about gardening with native plants is that not only am I doing it for myself aesthetically, but also for kind of this more vibrant uh, system. I see more insects, more wildlife than I did before I started doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think oaks are a really nice example of that. They are, and like she mentioned, you will see little small blemishes on the leaves. That just means one of those insects that she talked about is kind of there on your oak. Uh, we occasionally see oak galls, and there's a bazillion types <laughs> of oak galls, uh, but they really don't cause any major problem. The only one is the horned oak gall, mm -hmm. which can be very um, heavy in populations, especially on pin oaks. They love pin oaks. They can make these big golf ball-sized galls that kind of weigh the branches down doesn't really kill the tree, but it kind of makes them less attractive and it kind of can pull down the branches. So that's really the only one I can think of that's of any 
major significance. Uh, but again, it doesn't kill the tree. It just kind of makes it look less attractive. And in general, oaks, you know, they top our list because they're great species. They're great shade species. They live a long time, but they're relatively insect and disease free. There are some issues for them in our area, but a lot of times that's accompanied by trees that are stressed. And while oaks is included here as a broad group, there are many different oak species. And there are some that I think are a little overused in our landscape areas. Even though they're native, I think that they're used a little bit too much or maybe relied on a little too heavily. Not that they're bad species, but they maybe get oversold a little bit. So one example would be that pin oak that you just talked about. Great tree, native species, can thrive in wetter sites. Naturally, you'd find it in kind of wetter areas. Um, can tolerate compaction, poor conditions, grows really fast. Downsides, does not last as long. It gets uh, bacterial leaf scorch too. That's another one I yep. just remembered about the pin oaks and some of the other red oak group mm -hmm. especially. I think Lexington has a problem with that. Oh my gosh. I've never seen so much bacterial leaf scorch as I have in Lexington, Kentucky. It's a disease that's going to get progressively worse over time. It's associated with stress as well. And so the more stressed trees are, the worse it is, the worse it becomes. And you really can't do anything about it. Um, but promoting the health of your trees goes a long way. And so instead of getting up here and talking about oaks in general, we wanted to talk about some particular oaks that maybe you've heard of pin oak, you've heard of willow oak, uh, red oak, some other species that are very common, but some other species that might be good selections in your landscape. So this first one here is swamp white oak. Who all has heard of this species, swamp white oak? Very good. Uh, I'd say 10, 15 years ago, fewer and fewer of you would have raised your hands when we asked that question. It is uh, becoming very, quickly used in the, the landscape trade. And there are lots of breeding work going on to cross it with the English oak and provide all kinds of new varieties uh, and uh, you know forms that are narrow, uh, forms that have less powdery mildew because the English oak is very prone to powdery mildew. So our native small white oak does great in our very humid summers. And uh, hence the name small white oak, it also likes really wet areas. So it is in the white oak group, the white oak group overall has less issues with some of the really scary things that can happen with oaks, uh, such as the sudden oak death and all that. And We don't have yeah, sudden oops. oak death here, so that's a positive. <laughs> um, you know, if you like bourbon, you like white oak, right? Because all of the bourbon that is made has to be aged in a new white oak barrel. Mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're one of the most common trees that you'll find in the woods as well. But when people talk about white oak, it's a broad group. Um, the, the true species white oak, beautiful tree, could be another great tree mm -hmm. for your landscape, but a, a little thickier than swamp white oak, right? And it grows a lot slower. So of the white oak group of our native white oaks, swamp white oak is the fastest growing. Uh, you can expect two to three feet a year of growth out of a tree when it's young, and uh, it's a very sturdy tree, so it's very storm resistant. Its fall color is not like going to knock your socks off ever. It's kind of a yellow to, to golden to brown at times, uh, but it's a very sturdy tree, and the bark exfoliates a little bit, uh, not too unlike a river birch, if you like that exfoliating bark on a tree. So uh, you can see some of that the, the exfoliation on the trunk and branches there. And this is going to grow up to be, you know, a large shade tree, not the tallest tree in the forest, but in your landscape setting, certainly a really nice selection for a large shade tree. Mm -hmm. And here are the leaves that you mentioned, beautiful yeah. shiny leaves with those rounded lobes of a white oak. But the undersides are this, I think, kind of beautiful and distinctive white color. Yeah. That's eye-catching. Hence the name Quercus bicolor, meaning two different colors. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there and you. some Latin today. So you're in luck. <laughs> and Latin then, is important because you can tell exactly what tree you're talking about. So Quercus bicolor is the swamp white oak. Quercus alba is the white oak, white oak. you know, that we, that we were talking about earlier. And so. then just because we want to make things extra complicated, if you go over across the pond into England, they have their own white oak, which fortunately is Quercus rovers. So we won't confuse the three of them. <laughs> um, but, and, and this does get some minor 
little leaf issues, some little leaf galls regularly, uh, but I've never seen it be a serious issue for the tree. Nice choice if you're not aware of it. Another, now this one, you might not have been aware of the storm bug, but I bet you are all aware of these stern of red seed. Is that right? Have you seen this before? And extremely common. A lot, I was driving here today, and just the side of the roads, all eastern red cedar. You probably saw what, a couple hundred thousand, maybe a million or so between here and Lexington. <laughs> and I, I will say, not the world's prettiest eastern red cedar either. So the trees that I pass on the side of the road are not species that you might immediately think of. Oh, this is a plant I want in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of ratty little things growing out of straight out of the ground, like out of a road cut. Um, but I think significant that they can do that. They can tolerate really compacted soil, really poor conditions, early colonizers, all of which kind of add to what we talk about with effortless. They're not going to need a whole bunch of hand holding these species. Right. And the reason why we selected it today is that everyone wants evergreens for their landscapes, for their gardens. Do we have a lot of native evergreen trees from? No. Not very many. No, we don't. We have Easter red cedar, we have holly. You got some of the pines, you know, Pinus virginiana, the uh, uh, pitch pine, uh, and shortleaf pine, and that's it in Kentucky, uh, especially in not any different in India or Ohio. So um, that's kind of, it's kind of a tough thing to pick out. And unfortunately, the ones you see native here are usually Juniperus virginiana. So you will see uh, Virginia pine in a few pockets here and there. It's usually planted uh, if you see it in this part of, of Kentucky or in the immediate Cincinnati area across the way behind us at the church parking lot, they've got a little patch of Virginia pines, but someone planted those uh, probably 30 years ago. And they're not reproducing, they're not, you know, sprouting up under the parent tree because they like an acidic loamy soil and our soil here is more uh, neutral to alkaline. So this tree loves that, that you know, clay, alkaline soil. Uh, just think about it. If, if it could sprout up on the side of the road, it's very well adapted and it's tough and it, it's a survivor. So that just means it'll be a survivor in your landscape. But I'll say, we're talking about this as if it's you know, it doesn't have any good traits. It's just our only evergreen and it can live. Um, but despite that, it does have a lot of really positive traits and increasingly so because I mentioned the trees that I passed on my way over. Those are not the Eastern red cedar you might plant in your yard. I mean, you could, you could get a straight species, but the nice thing about them is that there's a whole lot of diversity in terms of their growth form. And that has resulted in the ability to make a lot of different cultivars with Eastern red cedar that might better fit what you have in mind. Um, so just kind of to show some pictures, this might be maybe more commonly the form that you'd think of. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very useful in different settings. Now, as they age, they're gonna get more and more unruly, I'd say. <laughs> Is that an accurate Character, assessment? they start to develop character. They, develop they spread character. out some and put out some longer branches and you know, a snowstorm or ice storm might come through and do something to them. So here we have some of the selections that have been made. Uh, these were all found in the wild in Eastern North America. Uh, so the top left corner, that is uh, uh, the variety Glauca. It's just a natural occurring bluish form that's more blue-green or very blue, depending on, on uh, their age and how well they're doing. Uh, so that's one that if you want to, if you had a blue spruce, a Colorado blue spruce, of course, we all know those are dying off of needle cast and uh, there's another canker that gets them uh, with the uh, stressful weather that we have here. They're native to Colorado and the Rocky Mountains and our climate here is very different than Colorado. If you go to Colorado in the middle of July or August, you will enjoy it immensely. If you come here sometimes on a typical hot summer day, not so much. And so really that, that humid hot climate has really knocked uh, the Colorado blue spruce off of the, uh, the good plant to uh, use list. So that's a good alternative. Uh, also down on the lower left side here, we have the variety Burkei. So that's another form that's kind of a blue green. It's, it's lighter and green, kind of bluish. Um, 
at times. This was photographed last June. I went down to the Atlanta Botanic Garden up at the uh, Gainesville uh, campus for Atlanta Botanic Garden. And that tree is only 10 years old, maybe less than 10 years old and it's about 25, 30 foot tall. So they grow really fast. Uh, this, that form has kind of a little bit more of an open architecture, kind of an open pyramidal. And so it's a really beautiful form. And then if you are like most of us and you're in a cramped suburban lot and your neighbors don't want anything you plant to touch their fence or <laughs> go across their property line, then you have the one called Taylor. So Taylor's there on the right. And that is a very narrow, uh, dense columnar form of Eastern red cedar. It was found in Nebraska, just out on a farm field. And uh, it, it will only get about three to four foot wide and easily 30 foot tall or, or more. So it can get some height and then it's also very narrow. So this one you would wanna plant a little bit closer than some of the other evergreens that you would find out there because they, they do take, it does take a lot of them to start to form a screen. Yes. This is Burkai, so B-U-R-K-I-I, -I -I, Burkai. It's an old cultivar that's been around for eons, uh, really. And in the horticultural world, 40, 50 years is, is, is eons because, you know, Proven Winners is out there, like, cranking out new varieties constantly. So it's a, a, an older tried-and-true variety that never took on because there wasn't a need for it because everybody could plant Colorado Blue Spruce till. The sun went down and no one cared about anything other than blue spruces. And so now we don't have a choice. We're going to have to go back. What was the name of the one above us? Glauca? That's, that's Glauca. Glauca. G-L-A-U-C-A. -A, Glauca. So that just means that's <laughs> Latin for bluish. <laughs> Glaucus, waxy coating. That's, that's a plant terminology. So those names like that tells you that it's an older cultivar when they use uh, those sorts, sorts of names. It's not quite as snazzy as some of the newer yeah. ones. Huh? So Taylor's newer. <laughs> Taylor was named, I don't know why, what, how it was named. It was a person or a location. So that, that's uh, the reason it's, it's named a little bit more less Latin sounding. It is, but uh, Canadian hemlocks, eastern hemlocks, they, they really like that eastern Kentucky, southeastern Ohio, Appalachian yeah, soil. Yeah. 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 They will do okay here um, in my subdivision, which is only two miles from here. They've, we have uh, hemlocks at the very front entrance, but it's a nice yeah. built up soil that's well amended, well mulched. There's irrigation that comes on in the summertime if it gets too dry. So they're, they're happy in that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, all of these evergreen trees are great for wildlife. Uh, birds love to nest and have places to roost at night in the evergreen trees. Uh, my neighbors have a giant row of arborvitae. And if there's a hawk that comes visiting the bird feeders, they'll fly into the arborvitae <laughs> and literally 200 birds will come flying out in all directions because they're just in there. How does hemlock reproduce? Mine always get these little tiny pine cones on them. But yeah. I never do see any hemlock coming. It's because they want that acidic loam. They hit that that heavy clay that's not acidic enough and they just won't they may germinate and they'll just, they'll perish. And in my area, I don't know about here, but I imagine you all see the same thing. The hemlocks are quite yellowy, quite light green relative to the needles, relative yeah. to the, what they would be. And they're also very susceptible to elongate hemlock scale, which is an invasive insect issue. Um, you've probably heard of hemlock woolly adelgid. It's another invasive issue impacting hemlock. But in landscape settings, I see elongate hemlock scale far more common. And it just drains the resources. It's a tiny little scale insect on the underside of those needles. And if you have hemlock, I recommend looking for it. And if you see it, you can treat your trees with an insecticide, dinotefferin, um, to try to help it kind of fight that off. Because it will... I think those spikes are uh, fertilizer. I don't think that they would help. I think you'd want to do like a, um, a granular or a soil drench with a dinotefferin containing product. Like, uh, that would probably, well, I don't know. Um, some dogwood trees are treated for fungal issues, yeah. and that would be different than what you'd need for this insect. Um, but if you go to the store and you'll see it, it's like labeled for tree and shrub insect issues. They, uh, calls it, they call it systemic insect control, and it lists scales and uh, borers like the emerald ash borer too as well. I'm going to do it with sand next to you because okay. apparently... Mm -hmm. Oh and no. It keeps dropping and I keep watching it and I keep pressing it, but I'm just going to stand. Is that okay? <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> is 
Will you ask people online if they can hear it okay if we just stand? It's coming through okay. now. Perfect. Okay. So I, I was just watching it go in and out, and it was, it was distracting me. <laughs> so I didn't do that. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, the hemlocks can be a challenge. It's one that probably would have to spend more time on watching. Um, if you get lucky and you have a really good sight, then you might not ever have any issues. I got lucky. I lived yeah. over in Hebron. They were always yeah. tall when I dug them up. They're always in rocky <laughs> yeah. soil and stuff. They're hard to get out. So this part of the area can be weird, too, because we were the only part of the state that was ever glaciated. So the Wisconsin era glaciation came down, literally was over top of this area, went to the airport, kind of flattened out that the area where the airport is because of where you know what what the glaciers did so they kind of left a, a a moraine there an older ancient moraine and it was a nice place to put the airport so that's why the airport's there really and then it went further southwest just above the arboretum left a lot of re, uh, glacial conglomerate rocks down there so there are pockets of really acidic soil in nor especially in northern central and northern boone county yeah. uh that you know, there were some giant sourwood trees and a few of the subdivisions that were real close to the east side of the airport. And we're like, how this happened? And, and that was when Mike Claire was still here and they did some soil pH testing. I think that this one house had a pH of like five or something in the front yard and they had beautiful sourwoods. Yeah. So they just got lucky, experimented, put them out. And, then... and that would be a great place for a hemlock. It would. <laughs> I like hemlock. Yeah. I got that. Yeah, so you'll see big ones around town, and then you'll see some really scraggly ones that are really just like, oh, why did you put me here? Well, I bought one at a nursery. They just got them in. I never even thought about it, but I ended up buying it anyway. It's a California hemlock. And they're totally different. Yes. Looking. Yeah. They just hang down, and I plant it. I guess it'll live. It's been there <laughs> two years now, but it's nothing like the hemlock we had. Yeah, yeah. Occasionally, you'll also see uh, Asian hemlock yes. as well. And our hemlock, Wooly Adelgid, is from Asia. Uh, so, so they may be a little bit better they, adapted. They are better, better able to deal <laughs> with it than ours are. But they're different trees. They're not our same hemlock. Yeah. They don't grow as large. You know, they're just different. And they're kind of more stiff. Like from Asia? Is that where they brought that in from? It is. Yeah. And I think it's another advantage of using native. So, so this native. Like the, the reason, one of the big reasons to use it in your landscape is that some of the non-natives just don't perform as well. You know, you can plant them and they're temporary trees that you'll have to cycle out like your Colorado blue spruce. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna thrive. Um, other natives that we'll talk about, I think we're, we picked them because they bring something unique and special, whether it's attracting particular pollinators or insects or, you know, just, just something spectacular. But I think another really good reason to increase your use of natives is that we don't know what's going to become invasive a lot of times until it's the cat is out of the bag. Too late. Until it is yeah. too late. Um, and now we know that, yes, bush honeysuckle is invasive. Honey it's terrible. But what about calorie pear? All the beautiful pear tree, yeah. beautiful pear trees that will be blooming in a few more weeks. And who knows what the next one will be? Um, there are a lot of non-natives that are fabulous in, in your landscape. You know, they bring something unique and beautiful. But I'm sure there will be something 10 years from now that we were like, man, I wish we had known then what we know now about that species and we hadn't planted it. Mm -hmm. So so that's another that's not going to happen with your natives. <laughs> right. They won't become invasive all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, so that's another perk. Um, so we have so many different species, though. And this we is do. another one that I think is a really different reason why it was selected and fit for your landscape. So yellow buckeye is one of our native large buckeyes, the, and also known as horse chestnuts. If you're across the pond over in Europe, they call the Aesculus uh, trees horse chestnuts. So over here in the United States and in North America, we call our Aesculus trees buckeyes. So uh, yellow buckeye is a fantastic native tree. It gets huge though. Uh, if you've ever been across the river over at uh, Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati, <laughs> They have some really massive uh, yellow buckeyes. Some of them are over 150, 200 years old. Uh, they're 90 to 100 foot tall and these beautiful, they're not very spreading. So they're kind of like columnar, maybe 20, 30 foot tall tree, uh, broadly columnar. Um, and they have these beautiful, you know, yellowish flowers in the spring. The other thing also about the yellow buckeye is that it does not get the Gignardia leaf blotch disease that the Ohio buckeye gets really badly. So and red, buckeye, and red unfortunately, yeah. And we'll show you some pictures of red buckeye too. And I think it's one of those that's just fabulous. Like it is 
the, the flowers when they're in bloom are gorgeous and there's nothing quite like it. Mm -hmm. um, but they do get this uh, kind of leaf issue, makes them look terrible midsummer to late summer. So, you know, that's, that's why this is on the effortless list. <laughs> yes. So here, here you can see the form. Again, it's not extremely spreading, unlike some of the, uh, like the, the Japanese horse chestnut or the uh, European horse chestnut, the yellow buckeye is much more upright. Um, I'm not saying you could cram it into a really narrow location, but it, it is uh, less broad spreading than a lot of the other uh, species of, of horse chestnut and buckeye. So uh, again, the foliage is very nice. Uh, here's Ohio buckeye. I just kind of, we kind of dissed it a little bit, but it's still a great tree. The, the leaf blotch that makes it lose its leaves about August and September does nothing to hurt the tree whatsoever. And it doesn't hurt red buckeye either. Um, but if you plant these trees and you aren't uh, aware of that or don't let your future um, you know, property owner that buys your house know about that, they might cut down your, your trees if they think they died in, in August. So um, other than that, they're great uh, plants that are uh, very well adapted here and probably have a host of uh, other insects and things that, that depend on them. Yeah, I think they're beautiful. And I think we even have included the red buckeye, just in case you haven't seen this one before. Um, this you're not going to see growing around here in the wild, but it is you know, native to this region, and those flowers are just spectacular. Yeah. Closer. Closer. Okay. How about now? Can we hear? Okay. Great. All right. Uh, yeah. So another beautiful species. But this one, yeah, don't be surprised by it. It will drop all of its leaves by late summer. Every August, we have visitors and staff at the Arboretum wanting to know why our trees died. What, what killed that tree? It's so beautiful. It was so beautiful. It's, it's fine. It's not dead. And it will come out in March and April every spring, just as beautiful as it was before. Oh, here's another. We can move on to our next native tree. This is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, I love this one. And we already mentioned calorie pear and the challenge of calorie pear. So everyone loves calorie pear, or maybe, I don't know if they still do, but when it was first promoted, you know, the smaller tree form, the white flowers in the spring. Um, of course, again, this did not pan out the way it was promoted. This is not, calorie pear is not a perfect tree. It falls apart, it smells bad, it produces prolific seeds that take over your natural areas. And I think service berry, is a really nice substitute in a lot of ways. As you can see, its form is not quite the same. You can have calorie pear that grow quite large, even though it's considered a small tree. Mm -hmm. And surface berry is not going to quite do that. But I think it's got a beautiful form and is really nice in a landscape setting. And it's being used heavily in the landscapes. Um, there are various forms that have been uh, selected uh, from the nursery tray that are, that are out there. Um, and you can buy the straight species as well. <clears throat> I can't remember if we had any pictures of some of those different forms, um, but the, there are different species within this amelanchier group, uh, which might be something worth talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, so <clears throat> we have the Allegheny service berry, which is usually what is planted the most in this area. Um, there's the apple service berry, which is a, it's a, a natural occurring hybrid ex grandiflora. Uh, cumulus is, is one of those selections that's usually sold. It's more arborescent, so it's happier to be, to be a single trunked tree that has a nice 20 to 30 foot tall canopy and about you know 10 to 10 to 20 foot wide. Uh, brilliance is another form of that of that hybrid, the natural hybrid, and it forms a nice small tree. Um, the Lavis varieties, which is the Allegheny service berry, they tend to be more shrubby and and they do sucker some. So if suckers bother you, uh, you might want to try to stick with the more arborescent forms. And they will also occasionally put up suckers at the base of the tree, but that's okay. Another nice thing about service berry is that these flowers will develop into fruit, which you can eat and they're quite good, but that's only if you manage to beat all of the birds to them. Yeah. They are very popular with them yeah. as well. So. We rarely see ripe fruit on our trees <laughs> at the Arboretum. They just get the berries. Which variety does um, they're all about equal with that. So they will live in fairly heavy clay soil. 
Um, if it starts to get really wet and saturated, you may have issues. Uh, you may have some you know, poor growth, decline, that sort of thing. So if you can try to get them in a, a better draining uh, soil situation, they'll do a lot better. It might help. So the, the real test is to d just go out and dig a hole, you know, about as deep as your container would be, maybe a foot deep or so and about this big around, fill it with a bucket of water and then come back an hour later. And if that, that hole that you've dug out and you fill with water is completely drained out and there's no water in there, you're good. If you come back in an hour and it's half full of water, you're a batch that's not gonna probably do, that, do very well. If it's completely full of water and it's barely gone down an inch, don't even think about it. And that applies to lots of other things. Most of our native trees do like to bloom in the spring in this, in this region of the country. Yeah, it's kind of right up there with evergreens in terms of something that is challenging to find. And I think there's a good reason for it, like from the, tr the tree's perspective, like why don't our native trees bloom in the summer or have evergreen needles and leaves? I mean, if you look, evergreens do terrible in ice storms and in the type of kind of winter conditions that we get, they do not thrive in those. Um, I think with the summertime uh, flowering, I would imagine it would have its own kind of set of challenges with our uh, sometimes extreme summer conditions. Um, now, there are non-native plants that do flower in the summer, and there might be some good ones for you to select if that's important for you that aren't invasive. Um, you know, don't carry that risk with right. them. Right. Not all native plants are, are evil. There are some that are per perfectly well behaved that don't spread and cause issues, but definitely do your homework before you, you plant and make sure that they're safe and, you know, do plenty of Google searches to make sure that that's not an issue. Nowadays, the internet's really good at pointing that out. Uh, we have really good resources online that, that highlight invasive plants and what is and is not. Uh, what's, I'm trying to think of that one that's really always pops up. Um, invasive.org yeah. is the website. And so for example, two that come up a lot because of that are mimosa and golden rain tree. I don't advise planting either of those because um, I consider both of those. Uh, mimosa is certainly invasive, golden rain tree potentially invasive. And so those are ones I wouldn't advise. Yep. Repeat the question. Oh yes, good call. The question was how about native uh, trees that flower in the summer? And it's a tricky, a tricky uh, issue there because you know our native don't want to do that as much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, I was struggling with that for a little bit while I was in That's the way I handle that. <laughs> yeah. I like it. So the good thing is that we do have lots of native perennials and, and those can be summer flowering. And a few of our native shrubs do kind of bloom more in the summertime. So we'll be we touching those uh, on those next. Okay. Um, so we do have, I think, one more native tree to cover and that's pawpaw. Um, so that is certainly not a summertime flower. Uh, it's going to flower in the next month soon. or so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the next month or so. And these are the flowers. Um, well, I think they're quite beautiful. I don't think this is something you would plant for the flowers. They're they're pretty easy to miss. Kind of this chocolatey, uh, deep purple brown color. And you have to look up underneath to see inside the flower. So they kind of hang down in little bell shaped flowers. Yeah. But of course, you know, the reason why everybody knows of papa, or you should know of papa, is because of their delicious fruit. It is the reason why I personally have planted a lot of papa, because I love papa fruit, um, like eating it. Uh, but it's also a very hardy, uh, small tree that's a great selection for a lot of different landscapes. They can do well in the understory of the forest, which, which is where you usually see those growing. Um, but they also do equally well. Uh, and, you know, out in full sun, you can put them in your home landscape, in the you know, backyard, front yard, side yard, and they're not going to be a giant space hog. So you're looking at a tree that will top out in the 20, 25 foot range in height and maybe about 10 to 15 foot wide. Um, I've got one in front of my driveway or in front of my house next to my driveway. And uh, I have a few neighbors that walk by every year and 
they some people know what it is and they asked me is it going to have pawpaws this year uh, i stopped pollinating it i was taking a few twigs off of a few pawpaws of the arboretum and bringing them to my single tree and i would take a paintbrush and pollinate on my flowers the last time i did that i had so much fruit that they like broke the branches and i was like okay i don't need to do that they do yeah 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 so the when you see a grove out in the wild it's usually one suckering clone like genetically all identical stems because they do sucker quite a bit and so yeah so they're usually that clone it's it's one single clone you need a different genetics in there to mix in so if you planted a, a variety that's been selected for larger fruit next to a grove you'll have great pawpaw set on that cultivar like overlease or whatever you use susquehanna there's all kinds of nice varieties that, are, that were developed for you know larger fruit and and different flavor types. I so, three of them, all three of them. <laughs> well, they do. I have had verticillium wilt problems with them um, in the past, especially on some of the grafted cultivars. Um, so it's something to think about. You know that that initial transplant stage. You know, also sun scald because a lot of times where these want to grow is in the woods in the understory. Yeah, that's where I dug edge. them up at in yeah. the woods, and I put them out and opened. It's really hard to dig them up from the woods. I've had yeah. uh, that they challenge don't. as well. No, I think yeah. that's why they all died. It was rough on them. You need yeah. to put them in a container, the, the seed, and then, you know, a long, narrow container for the taproot. Yeah. Yeah. And they have good golden orange fall color, too, uh, and the more sunlight, especially as you get. Yes. How far apart will they cross pollinate? The question was, how far apart will they cross pollinate? Hmm. I think it kind of goes with the rule that I've heard for hollies. Uh, around 100 to 300 feet is about the as far as they will fly between plants to be to get really good cross pollination um, for for insects, not just bees, but for for other things. So bees we, definitely. We planted some at the top of our, our property, and then I was amazed to find some. You're saying they grow in the understory. I found mm -hmm. a total canopy of honeysuckle. Right. I found a little patch of them growing down there, so I'm going to open yeah. them all up. So as far as the, that sounds about right. So as far as, yeah. you can, you can, you can self pollinate them. If you Google pollination of pawpaws, you'll see a video on YouTube uh, should be Sherry Crabtree with Kentucky State University. She has an excellent video on YouTube about how to pollinate. And it's really easy. Just get a little paint brush and you got to know what type, what stage of flower you have because they do change sex over a, the course of a couple of days they start out i can't remember if they start out male or female but anyway they just kind of switch on you so you got to know what you're looking at before you do it so watch her video and he, she'll explain all of that yes the question was um most fruit trees need to be sprayed does pawpaw need to be sprayed and no that's like one of the nice things about it as a native and why it's on our effortless native is that if you were growing, I think any Anything other else. fruit tree, any other fruit yeah. tree, you would have, it, it's, it's, that's a serious issue is, is dealing with insect and disease problems of apples, of peaches, of, you know, pear, whatever you'd like to have. For papa, it is virtually insect and disease free, especially once it's established. Um, will it have occasional, you know, insect herbivory? Certainly. And um, Papa, uh, you know, has some interesting uh, and, and great kind of close associations with particular insects. Um, so you might get to see some unusual ones, but they're not going to hurt that tree substantially. So that's another perk of a Papa. Yeah. Uh, I know that The question was, is there a variety of tree that tastes good and doesn't need to be sprayed? And you're talking about pawpaws, correct? Correct. So none of them need to be sprayed. Um, it kind of depends on the different tastes. So when we have the pawpaw tasting, gosh, what do we have, 16, 20 varieties? Um, and everyone puts out a card and they kind of rank which one they like the most and everybody likes something different. I personally like uh, Susquehanna. Mm -hmm. Or is it Shenandoah? I think, no, it's Susquehanna. It's from like the Shenandoah Valley area of Virginia. That's where it was found. Uh, I also like Sunflower, which I think came from Eastern Kansas, I think. Uh, that Those two to me, I like, but my taste will be totally different than yours and other people are in the room. So 
got to come to our pawpaw tasting party, which will be in September here, probably this building, um, and hopefully we'll be virtual and uh, also in person as well. So we'll do a hybrid again of that. Uh, so if you come in person, you can taste the different pawpaw fruit. And get at least two. Otherwise, as we mentioned, you won't you won't uh, get to enjoy them as much. But I'll say if you find them in the wild, you'll find a great range of how good they taste from very good to just terrible. And mm -hmm. <laughs> just because the fruit doesn't taste good, though, doesn't mean that they're not still a nice tree. And so even if you're not buying a grafted cultivar, if you're buying, you know, um, uh, seedlings that have grown up so you aren't certain what the fruit's going to taste like, I still think it's a really nice tree. It is. It definitely is. Are they sold at local nurseries? They are. They're actually a very hot commodity. Uh, every nursery in this area at some point or another probably will be selling them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that we are, we are, I knew we could talk Chris, but I didn't realize quite how much we could talk about. <laughs> My presentation style is usually racing through hundreds of plants at a time. So I'm like, but well, I don't usually slow might, down. We might get to do that for the next couple. <laughs> but we wanted to include redbud as well. Redbud, tried and true landscape tree. There's no, I mean, there's a lot of them already in the landscape, but I just think this is such a beautiful flowering small tree. Um, that it merited inclusion on this list. Definitely. So uh, our native red bud is fine just as it is. If you, if you want to buy straight species, um, ironically, they're getting harder and harder to find because everybody wants all the new forms with different color leaves and flower hues and all that. Uh, but if you can find straight species red bud, perfectly fine and very wonderful native tree to have. Um, the state nursery, so the Kentucky... Uh, nurseries, the forestry division of forestry state nursery program uh, usually has redbud tree seedlings for sale. So that's a good source for uh, low cost uh, native redbud seedlings. But then there's a myriad of cultivars out now that have yellow foliage, orange foliage, purple foliage, bronze, and they have really, really dark pink and almost purple flowers and everything white and white flowers, flowers which are the, there's a there's a natural form that's white. Yes. So there's a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Now they do only live about 20 years, especially if you put it in a hot, sunny, dry place that gets drought. There's this thing called Botryosphaeria canker that will get them. You'll see the trunk kind of sink, sink in. And that's just what happens. And as they get older and they get stressed from you know, really bad drought years. But the thing is you can take that tree out, replace it with a little tree this tall. And in three to five years, you've got a tree that's already 20 foot tall again and replace the one that you just lost. So they're very fast growing. Mm -hmm. uh, they easily, uh, replace themselves once you put a new one in, if you lose one. So at the Arboretum, we have a whole row of them along our front um, highway that we just keep rotating in and out. And when we got there today, you'll probably see one laying on its side. Our ice storm pulled it over and snapped its roots off. So we've got one we're going to be replacing this spring. Do they grow easily from seeds? They do, Question, yes. Do they grow easily from seeds? And yes, they do. Very easy. Sometimes too easily. If you have one in your yard that's producing seeds, you will have them everywhere in your yard, but you know. I've gone up into my wild park and pulled a couple yeah. of poop bags with seeds and thrown them all over the place. So here's a tip. We have this thing on the first Tuesday, well, starting on the first Tuesday of April, but every Tuesday through October, we have a thing called our volunteer work day at the Arboretum, and we volunteer to go take care of our garden areas and flower beds. And we have so many redbud seedlings. You could have one every time you come out, probably. <laughs> You, you weed it out for us, it's yours. You can take it home. So uh, <laughs> if you're interested. So those are just some photos of the flowers and those seeds we were talking about abundant. I think they're kind of pretty and they provide some interest once the plant's done flowering. I've heard other people say the opposite. So to each their own. If you mm -hmm. don't like the look of that, you know, there, there are um, some cultivars that don't have those. Um, also note that there are some non-native cultivars of red buds, so just, just keep that in mind. You do see that Chinese red buds sold, so mm -hmm. just be careful you're not buying one of those. Yep. Well, we have 10 minutes to get through shrubs and perennials. Can I can do, do it, it I can do it. Can we do it? You do it. <laughs> I may just drag. Okay, <laughs> All right, here, so. I'll give you this. Yeah, here we go. I'll be too slow. <laughs> I wanna look at the pretty pictures and talk about it. All right, so buttonbush. This is probably the closest thing that we have to a summer blooming native 
woody plant. So this is a shrub. They could be considered a tree. They do get about 12, 15 foot high. And if you limb them up, they kind of, they can kind of look like a multi-stem tree. Uh, it will fight you though. It doesn't want to be, a it will put up new suckers to try to replenish all the stuff you cut off. So you can try, it probably won't want to be a, a uh, small tree. But anyway, it blooms in June usually, and it is a fantastic pollinator plant. So you get tons of bees, uh, everything under the sun, other insects visiting those flowers. And they're very, very pretty. So wild hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence. How many of you all probably have heard of, oh, Annabelle hydrangeas. Uh, that's, that's a variety that was selected out of the uh, wild hydrangea. So if you go down the road about three miles south of here, there's a, a, a creek called Gunpowder Creek for those that are um, local people that live in this area. Uh, Gunpowder Creek is lined on some of the northern slopes of the creek beds with this, this plant growing on the sides of the hills. So it's very, very locally native. It does really well here. And uh, it may not be sold very often as a straight species, but if you look around, it is available at some of the specialty native plant nurseries. And then of course you can do, you could buy Annabelle. It's just a little bit heavier flowering. The flower heads are a little bit larger, but it's pretty much this, this plant. If you put it in dense shade, it'll have less flowers, more leafy, kind of fall over a lot. The more sunlight you have, the stouter it will be. And that's actually Annabelle. So Virginia sweet spire, this is a knockout, great native shrub. Uh, I wouldn't say indestructible, but it's about there. I mean, you can put this out once it's established, it starts, you know, mounding a little bit, kind of spreading some. Beautiful uh, late spring display, not quite summer. I think they probably bloom in May-ish, uh, but you get tons of pollinators on these plants. And then the fall color is just phenomenal. So it's very long lasting. You can get several weeks of beautiful red fall color, uh, you know, mid October through Halloween some years. So Eastern nine bark, that's a great native shrub that the horticultural trade has really latched onto. I would say, gosh, back when I first got into the industry in the nineties, you know, it really wasn't that well known. They you know, had picked out Diablo, which had the purple foliage but Diablo had powdery mildew issues really bad and it just, they died from, from all kinds of issues. So they've since been selecting more and more forms of Eastern nine bark. You can get the native wild type and it does really well. Uh, you could have a little bit of issues with powdery mildew if you put it in an area that's kind of a little too shaded. Uh, the more sunlight you have it out in an open, open airflow areas, the, the less issues with powdery mildew you'll have, but it's not gonna hurt it. It's very perfectly well adapted to that. And the, the bark is beautiful, nine bark. It almost has nine different layers of bark. That's hence the common name there. So very colorful. And it's a uh, mid-sized shrub, maybe on the larger mid-sized shrub, six to eight foot tall. We have a question in the back. Uh, how wide and how tall will it grow? So they, depending on the, on the variety that you buy. If you get the straight species, uh, nine bark, you're looking at about six to eight foot tall and wide. Uh, there are, you know, there's like tiny wine. It's a, it's a kind of a dark leaf one, purple leaf form that's very, very small, it has smaller leaves, everything about it smaller, and that's about three by three. But it does vary widely on what you, what you select. But and the that, wild type is the largest. That's a nice one to plant kind of in mass as well. If mm -hmm. you wanted more of a, a hedge-like look or... Um, you know, not just having one, but having several together. Yep. So airwood viburnum. Um, this by far is one of our really nice, easy to use viburnum species. They um, are another larger mid, you know, on the larger side of mid-sized shrubs. So again, about six to eight foot, maybe 10 foot tall on, on the straight species. Uh, beautiful white flowers. Uh, they bloom probably mid-April. And then later on in the fall, you have these beautiful uh, bluish purple fruit that attract uh, birds and are very beneficial to the wildlife. And I think the foliage on those it's is just very so nice. pretty. Very, it's a really nice, nice leaf. Very glossy, very attractive. So black hall viburnum, another really good one. This one's huge though. They easily get 15 to 20 foot high. They do sucker some so they can spread and form like a nice, this could be a good privacy fence uh, planting if you don't care about the winter time. Of course it is deciduous, so it will lose its leaves and you will uh, have a tree that you can see through later on or shrub later on in the year. 
but during the summertime, if you needed, you know, if you have an outdoor patio that you don't go out on in the wintertime and don't care about, this would be a good plant to use around patios or other screening purposes. So uh, the uh, fall color is always a nice red and uh, sometimes uh, hues of purple. And that has a, a lot of fruit set usually too. Oh my gosh. Five Probably minutes left. Stretch. <laughs> um, both of those viburnums can do well in shade. You'll just get a more open plant. So it'll be thinner and kind of open itself up. The leaves will get a little bit larger to adjust to, to less uh, light. And they will just be more open and kind of thinner looking. They, they can, yes. Yeah. There are some other good shade loving native shrubs though that maybe you could just briefly mention. The question was, will those grow around shade? And I think with the flowers, they'll probably flower nicer when they have full they sun. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to spice bush being a shade? Spice bush lover? would be fantastic. Yeah, that's one that you can definitely use. I didn't stick it in there because I thought Ellen would be like, why, why? Because Ellen is a disease, I forest diseases. Bush, <laughs> right. I'm a big spice bush fan. And it, right now it has a, there's a new invasive disease that's killing spice bush in some areas. I'm super hopeful that it's not going to be a problem in our landscape settings to be determined, but naturally it'll grow in the understory of forests. Um, it's getting ready to flower right now. Beautiful yellow flowers, one of the first natives to flower in the spring. Uh, one of Gorgeous. them underneath all my honeysuckle too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if, if you can, uh, in some places, people don't like who manage woodlands, don't like spice bush because it will grow as densely, not quite as densely, but almost as densely as honeysuckle. It will kind of take over. Oh, Coral perfect. berry would be another yeah. one that, yeah, it's probably going to look better if it's got full sun, but it will thrive in yes. those shadier conditions too. Coral berry, now it's going to be a little smaller. It is. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, that could go nice with your spice bush too. And the horticultural trade has picked up on yeah. coral berry and is now starting to sell it in, in nurseries as well because it's very tough. It's a type of honeysuckle, right? No, it's a, it's, they look similar. They have a similar leaf form, but it's different from honeysuckle. Okay. Same thing. Uh, they might be in the same, are, are they? They could are they be. Are that, I believe they are. Yeah. Um, for sure, but it's a native. So mm -hmm. it's a native. Right. Yeah. So moving along to perennials. So when we got to the arboretum today, sadly, there's not gonna be hardly any perennials to see because it's, it's what is it? It is March 10th. So not gonna see too much going on. I have wood poppies at my house. They are just starting to put a little bit of a rosette up uh, around the crowns because they're smart, they're native. They know not to be growing out like this in March. Yeah. My, just <laughs> at my house. Yes. Yeah. I have hellebores at my house that are like full bloom and like they'll be melted to the ground when we hit 14 degrees uh, Saturday night. So wood poppy, beautiful native plant uh, blooms, gosh, probably in the next month and just tons and tons of yellow flowers. Uh, if you're like me and brave enough to deadhead them off, uh, you'll get reblooming. I've had mine bloom through July just by like taking off the deadheads. Of course, if you want them to spread and set seed, don't do that because they won't be able to spread. But once you have them for a few years, you may wish you did that because they will keep moving around. Anywhere you've got shade, you'll have more and more and more of them. You can give them to all your neighbors, your family, friends, and everyone can have wood poppies. Celandine poppy is another name that people use for this, but not to be confused with lesser celandine, an invasive species that is blooming very shortly and that you do not want in your gardens or your yeah. yards. So this has like a, a kind of a... Uh, uh, sort of compound leaf and it gets about this high the lesser sound lesser, or yeah. big buttercup it's a buttercup so it's got this you know shiny shiny yellow color the leaves are kind of heart shaped heart shaped and maybe, maybe this tall maybe yeah. Yeah. beautiful but you don't want it don't be fooled there was a question back here okay so about about a foot and a half to, to two foot or so depends on how much shade they're in if you are like me and, you know, I'm a horticultural person at heart. So I put out some fertilizer and stuff and they get, they get a lot of loving. So mine get pretty tall. And if you're like me and you're like, you're going to have to figure it out. Please. You love pulling with water or fertilizer. Good luck. Um, they might be a little smaller, but they'll still thrive because by the time it gets hot in summer conditions, they're yeah. pretty much done for the year. Anyway, so, yeah. so another pro tip on wood poppies, if you're like me and you do try to like keep them blooming constantly, if you deadhead them, they put out a yellow sap. And they will dye your fingers and your clothes and everything yellow. So just, I think the Native Americans used them as a form of, as a dye source for clothing and stuff. So 
question over there. Very much shade. Yeah, too much sunlight. They they wilt a lot if it's really dry and in a sunny spot. So they, they enjoy shade. They could take morning sun and afternoon shade would be fine. Afternoon sun, morning shade, no. They will not be happy with that. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, this is the uh, wild columbine, which you know, beautiful plant with uh, gorgeous red flowers. And this is the one that I have in my front yard that this year was about this tall, which is abnormally tall for wild columbine. Um, but I would have people stop and take pictures of it. And I'd catch them taking pictures of my plants in my front yard, which is, as a gardener, like the best feeling in the whole world when you can catch someone taking pictures of your garden, right? <laughs> uh, so that's always a delight. Um, but I mean, they, they grow so well and they, they naturalize really well. Um, gorgeous when they're in bloom. Now they do have some minor issues. I always get um, some mm -hmm. saw flies on them mm -hmm. uh, that kind of mess up the foliage. In yeah. some years it can be worse. Um, and then if you want to, uh, this is an easy one too, once they've set seed and you know, you'll see the seed pots kind of dry out. You can shake a little bit, you hear a little rattling. That's when you can take them out and kind of like shake them around other spots where you've got shade and you want some more columbines. And they do germinate. Gosh, that fall, and so they, the next spring, those plants come up in those rosettes they create in the fall, and then you got your flowering. Now, there are a lot of commercially available cultivars of columbine that are beautiful, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, gorgeous definitely. colors, I'm not going to be as hardy, I'm not going to produce seed in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, not as reliable, you may eventually lose those. Yes, yeah, so. they might not uh, last as long, but they are gorgeous. So. Shade also. Uh, that's a full sun. Well, th that one is in full sun, but it will tolerate some shade as mm -hmm. well. Oh yeah, yeah. So this one is just that coloring? This, the wild one is that coloring, but if you look, you'll see them in all sorts of wild colors. Um, now, I don't think all of those are our native species. The, cult, the cultivars that are available. Right, they're, they're usually hybrids, complex hybrids. I've got some in my house that are kind of a creamy white. I've got some that are uh, really like burgundy colored and they are all X something, something X. So they've been crossed with other things and then selected. Some 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 oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of sad. <laughs> I've never seen native ones that are purple or, or yellow. Um, I've only seen kind of the, the cultivars that are, um, but yeah. I would trust Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to butterfly milkweed, this usually doesn't need any introduction. It's a smaller growing milkweed. It gets about two, maybe three foot tall if it's really doing well. Uh, but as the outstanding orange flowers, this is an outstanding pollinator plant and also an excellent uh, food source for the monarch butterfly caterpillars. Yeah, and I put some okay. photos in of, of mine this past year. Um, so I have a bunch of butterfly milkweed because I think they're beautiful. And naturally, of course, you find the caterpillars and then um, you know feeding, and that's a really fun thing. If you have children in your life that come see them, it's a really fun activity. This is uh, the chrysalis that formed on a different native perennial that we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, not on the milkweed, but on my switchgrass. And then of course, the beautiful monarch that emerges. And I think the next photo is, <laughs> you know, the excitement that comes from that, you know, the, the opportunity to use these natives, uh, not just aesthetically, but, you know, as this activity. And I'll, I'll give you, uh, for any of the, the educators or people who like to do activities with young people in their gardens, um, there is a super fun activity you can do just to catalog the diversity of insects that you see in your yard after you start doing something like this, after you start gardening with native plants versus before, or you know, a space that doesn't have those, it will be night and day. How much more diversity of different native insects you get after you start incorporating native plants into your landscape. We do a little checklist every year of the number of species and it's just kind of an informal fun thing to do, but mm -hmm. you know, it's really a stark contrast. Uh, Butterf the previous one? Tuberosa. Yeah, yeah, Asclepius tuberosa is the Latin name, yep. So this is the swamp milkweed 
Uh, I have this in my house. It's a very easy milkweed to grow, especially if you have really wet, heavy clay. It's not going to care about that. Swamp milkweed that grows in swampy locations that are really wet. Uh, it'll do just as fine in kind of a drier spot if you have average soil. Give it full uh, sunlight. Uh, this one gets pretty big. Uh, my plant has reached, gosh, you know, three and a half, four foot tall and about that in width and uh, very vigorous. It comes up each year. It's, you know, these are the previous one and this one are both perennial. So they come up uh, in the spring and die back in the fall. So you get a nice uh, summer bloom display with, with both of these plants. Um, and gosh, they're an excellent food source. Uh, we get tons, I get tons and tons of caterpillars on my small milkweed and all kinds of other cool little beetles and things are in there. It's like a whole community of things on the flowers all summer. So I it's think really this fun. this is the prettiest in my opinion, but also the best smelling of the milk. Mm -hmm. And purple milkweed. This one is one you don't see as much of, but it's worth checking out. Um, I think it's got a striking uh, bloom and is uh, probably more situated to a little bit drier soil. It's gonna like more of a you know, typical garden soil, not as much you know, standing water as uh, you know, could, could be tolerated by the swamp milkweed. But it's worth seeking out if you can find it. We had some at Fish and Wildlife. I used to work at Fish and Wildlife eons ago for the native pro, uh, plant program, and we sold this plant. World milkweed is another one, a little bit more obscure. It also uh, uh, will do better in kind of an upland site with uh, better draining soil rather than, than a really uh, dry, um, saturated soil. So uh, your butterfly milkweed, World milkweed and purple milkweed are, are better and more of a uh, drier type situation than, than say the swamp milkweed. Yeah. And they are all hosts for the monarch butterflies. So purple coneflower, um, who here has not heard of purple coneflower? I would be shocked if somebody raised their hand. <laughs> Oh, effortless native though we're delivering as promised right so you've heard of it you know it's an effortless native <laughs> so something we were talking about earlier is be careful if you're planting um you know cone flowers and you go to like a garden center and you see all these really you know cool ones that have various shapes and colors and all that uh the horticultural community has noticed that a lot of those newfangled cultivars and uh, plants that are overly bred to be like frilly and all that they are really short life. So uh, you, you, you might get two years out of some of those uh, really heavily bred plants. So we're finding out that the ones that are closer back to the original uh, straight species are really good. So, um, oh geez, what's that? Magnus was one of the first selections that, that kind of came out, gosh, you know, two or three decades ago. And Magnus is very true run of the mill native uh, purple cone flower has just a little bit larger flower, very intense colors and it does really well. Yes. Yeah. 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 The comment was about um, some of the cultivars of these native species um, will not live as long, but also will not be as good for pollinators and not as good for birds or other things that depend on the seeds because. You know, that's if they're not producing seeds, that's that's you yeah. know one of the reasons why you want to use natives. Yeah. So again, Magnus is a really good one. It produces tons and tons of seeds, it will reproduce. Um powwow is a little bit smaller, powwow echinacea. It's an all-America selections plant that came out. It blooms really nice, it's a little bit shorter, but it produces a ton of seed. We see goldfinches on ours all winter. We leave them up. Um there's also white swan, which is a white one that's pretty reliable. Um, it does occasionally kind of disappear after about five or six years, but it's very pretty and it may move around a little bit. And then um, it may cross back with the with regular purple cone flower if you have it and have like, the, you may have some really weird colored <laughs> cone flowers, but it also will seed, so. If you've got a really weird looking, beautiful red one <laughs> or orange, those those are usually the ones that tend to not be very hard. Cheyenne spirit. Cheyenne spirit. So, well, some of the Cheyenne, you know, Cheyenne spirit is kind of a, a weird mix. You get some yellows and oranges in there. That one's not the worst. It's probably a little bit better. But some, gosh, those like papaya was one of them. Look, papaya is not going to last, uh, unfortunately. So hopefully none of you will have planted that one. It's 
don't at the same time <laughs> expect it you to could last have long. planted a non-native species that also wasn't going to last and also was going to do that so right. i don't think this is any worse than that but you could have gotten longer lived and more benefits with that yeah. so so again the straight species is just wonderful no reason not to use it Here we have our little friend, the goldfinch. You will see them on uh, purple coneflower all through the winter. If you leave the uh, seed heads up. <clears throat> so another relative is the pale purple coneflower. It's really nice. Uh, fantastic uh, perennial plant that probably isn't utilized enough. Uh, it is available at a, at a few especially native nurseries, uh, especially online. <clears throat> and not, I don't see it too often in, in local garden centers, unfortunately, but it's uh, super tolerant to tough, dry sites, you know, full sun, dry, dry soil, does really well. <clears throat> so moving on to grass now, a lot of people like native uh, grasses. And so switchgrass is a, an outstanding native grass that you can use as an ornamental grass in your landscape. It can be used as an accent plant. It's big enough that you could use it for screening, you know, off the side of a patio, uh, various things like that. Uh, once you plant it, make sure that, you know, that's where you wanted it to be, like, because it, it's very hard to move. They, they grow extensive root systems. So really think hard, long and hard about, do I want a panicum frigatum there for the next couple of decades of my life? Because it will stay there for you. <laughs> oh, well, there are cultivars of this, and some of them are not native to the eastern U.S. So that's something to consider. So with this and with other native species, you know, if you can source from someone who's using locally collected seeds, then that's, that's a great option there. So North Wind is one that's really, really popular right now. Um, you'll see that anytime you see like a real blonde looking, puffy, voluminous switchgrass <laughs> in the landscape that kind of almost eats up the area it's in, that's usually North Wind. We have it in, our, in one of our rain gardens and it kind of gets incredibly huge uh, for what we were expecting. And it also seeds. So switchgrass, uh, almost all of them will readily seed around and you'll get more of them. Uh, we had it invade our rain garden. I didn't know that it could live in water. So it, it moved into a really wet area of our rain garden and uh, it didn't care, it laughed at me. And there are lots so. <laughs> of great native grasses out there. Um, some of them I think are a little trickier to grow. Now the flip side with this is that it is, it will take over some areas. So it's something to consider. Um, that's I I, it's something I hear complaints about. I know it, it's a great native grass, but then I heard people tell me, "Oh, I, uh, it, it's it can be really uh, tough," which is why we like it. Yeah. We have yeah. a question. Sorry. So you you could uh, I would expect you'd have to water them quite a bit to prevent curling of the foliage because. Once the uh, the panicums get going and you know get full size, that's a that's a pretty substantial plant with a lot of leaves and transpiration. So they probably would have to be watered every other day or, or so. Yeah, I I or unfortunately really they have big pots, like super big. Oh pots. yeah, <laughs> there, if you get a big enough pot, it would work. <laughs> it depends on which you know. Pretty tall. Yeah, pretty gosh, pretty like tall. usually at least this tall. Yeah. You can try, I can say that I've tried some other native grasses and not had as much success with the pots. I think trying this one is a great idea. Um, I've tried uh, big and little blue stems um, and it, it's just, it just doesn't work as well as I would like it to. So I hope yeah. the pot for the switchgrass works out well. Idea. And so in our last slide here is, it is in many more. So there are so many things, you know, we're gonna run out to the Arboretum now and look at some stuff that we have. You'll see some switchgrass that we haven't cut back yet. Good. So last year was a rough year for many people in the green industry. We didn't have a lot of staff to get a lot of stuff done. So please excuse our you know, mess. We've got some stuff that get, needs to get under you know, taken, but this year we're turning around, we're getting more staff uh, applying to our positions. So we should have a better year. But anyway, that means a lot of our perennials weren't cut back yet. So you can kind of get a good idea, especially with the switchgrass, how big they get, what they look like and how they look after the end of the winter. So we'll walk around and see all that. Question? Yeah. There was a question from the Zoom participants. What suggestions do you have for native perennials good for a hillside for buffy roach? 
pretty much everything we talked about today on the native perennial side. They would all work. Keep that so they know what oh. the question is raised. Uh, the question was um, perennials for a hillside to help with erosion. And the answer was a lot of what we talked about today. Um, that was a shady or uh, a bright sun. Did they mention that? No. Okay, that would that would be that would take me to different places. Would be you know how much sunlight do you have? Also, what else do you have growing there? Because if you have heavy pressure from invasive species already, I might steer towards some more. Um, rapid growing uh, native species um, versus if you don't, uh, you might, um, you know, have, have more leeway there with what mm. you do. There's just so many options. I mean, you could plant some native river cane and it would take over the hillside for you, but that's all you would have. Should we save the, the other slides for in the field or do you want to? Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. We, where to get these. Oh, let's, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Those are. Yeah. I'll, I'll run through this part really quick. Um, so we have a few tips for success when starting gardening with natives. And it sounds like some of you have a lot of experience too. So please share those as well with us. But these are some for us. First, know your plants and how they will grow. And I think that this is, is significant to think about because some of these natives are less well understood than some non-natives you might be more familiar with. We just mentioned one of these, river cane. I've purchased some river cane. It's a great, there it is in the back of my van. Lovely <laughs> species. You don't want to plant this in an area that you're worried about it taking over because it will take over. It will completely take over. Now, if that's what you want, you are in luck and that's great. But if that's not what you want, there are better choices. Um, the same with this sumac. Now, can you have sumac? That is beautiful tree form, a gorgeous fall color, all year interest. I think sumac is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. We do that. We make them stay trees that they are reading against their will. And, is that uh, an effort, effortless no. process? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> no, but you can do it. Right, and, and it's, it's beautiful and I love seeing that. Um, but just so you're not surprised by what you wind up with. And I'll just give you one more example from this, this garden. So this is lovely and you can see this, this uh, native wildflower sign and lots of uh, uh, different species there. But what you might not see in the back there is some Maximilian sunflowers. Are you familiar with Maximilian sunflower? Gorgeous native sunflower, perennial. Um, sunflower, um, beautiful, beautiful blooms that last forever. The birds love, love, love these all winter. Now you might also be noticing one little challenge though with these sunflowers. Um, uh, this, this growth form here of it being a squiggle that's fallen over, not the most aesthetically pleasing form for a front yard per se, especially <laughs> when they all flop over into your uh, neighbor's driveway. Um, that's not ideal, right? So there are ways around it. So naturally it would not grow by itself. And this is the first year of it. So this is what it looks like after one year. When it gets denser, it'll be less likely to do that. If you have more plants that are growing in there, kind of keeping it upright. But the other thing that you can easily do is just cut it down in June, take it down to three feet tall, and then it will grow a little bit more, but it won't get to 10, 12 feet tall which is just a little bit too tall for that setting. And you'll see this a lot with native plants of like. A lot of the prairie plants, you just also too, you don't, don't fertilize them ever. They don't need it. Usually they're fine with the soil you have. If you fertilize a lot of these native uh, prairie perennials like this, they just get massive and they, they can't stand like the summertime storms that we get and knocks them over. Ironweed, awesome native plant. Uh, Joe Pieweed, awesome native plant. But you can control how high they grow by pruning them in the summer um, so they can better fit your space. Now they, they will grow very tall and be amazing and that's great, but if that's not what you want, you know, keeping that growth form in mind. Uh, considering your style when planting, I put this in here because this is what um, we showed you that pale purple cone flower earlier. This is what it looks like where it grows wild around here. This is on a limestone blade, um, beautiful. 
beautiful, but not everybody wants to have a native prairie in their front yard, or you know, it's not everyone's or their local government won't allow it. Maybe the homeowners <laughs> association won't allow that. Um, so just kind of considering what kind of aesthetic that you you want. And I think a lot of the natives that we talked about, kind of an easy entry point for them is going to be to plant them in groups, plant them in big clusters of the same thing, and kind of gives that immediate aesthetic appeal, that interest. Um, uh, and it, you know, it might change over time because you might start out that way. Uh, you might seed or plant in more clumps, and then over time they naturalize and take over. Um, but there are kind of different approaches to doing that that I think are worth thinking about. I just thought of another native perennial that's yeah. beautiful, gorgeous, but you got to be careful using it. It's called obedient plant. And it's, its common name is the exact opposite of what it is. It is not obedient. They're beautiful. They're for the first couple of years, like, oh, this will be perfect. And then it will rapidly start getting larger and larger, eat up the whole garden you're in. You will have nothing but an obedient plant garden if you're not careful. It will kill your other native perennials. So that's one to be careful with. This is another one. Uh, I just think, um, especially because sometimes, you know, gardening with natives doesn't have, they don't have to be wild and outrageous. I mean, some of us might like that wildness to them, uh, but th they can, you know, get a little untidy at times, especially if you are trying to leave them there all winter and people are used to the winter appeal where everything is cut back. And that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to feed birds. You're trying to have overwintering areas for insects that are there. Um, borders, pathways, other hardscaping can make things look nicer um, all year round and kind of just help with giving your native plant gardening uh, a different aesthetic. And so this picture right here, these are just pictures I found from the internet when I searched for native plant gardening. But you can see that in the two on the right, they put in a stone border and it looks more formal because they've done that. Now you might not like that look and be like, no, thank you, I'm set. But if you live in an area that maybe everybody's houses, every front yard looks a particular way or your homeowners association requires it to look a particular way, that's a nice, kind of entry point to making yours more um, accessible. And this is another one on the bottom. That's kind of, I mean, it looks kind of fun if you like things spilling over, but if you have, or growing plants right up to the edge of your sidewalk and they're spilling over onto it, not everyone's gonna like that. <laughs> and so if you leave a buffer between those two, it adds aesthetically in my mind, but also kind of adds functionality there. So this is kind of another example of using that border, that hardscaping to define space in native um, plantings. Here's just another. Um, and this is one where they've mowed a border around the edge. Now they could have, oh, they could, I guess I didn't, they could have grown those plants all the way out to the edge. But if they'd done that every time it rained, they would flop over into the walking trail. And so that's a, a way to avoid some of that conflict that would happen naturally. Um, and so this is just another example and that this is kind of a, the progression of uh, a yard that's been planted with natives So that yard you saw earlier. So it started out all grass, put in a big mulch ring, put in some plants, but you can see that the difference of this to this, having that border, it looks, it looks intentional. It looks like somebody actually tried to do this instead of just accidentally coming up all in weeds, right? <laughs> mm. And I think just being a good neighbor when you start Gardening more with native plants is valuable because your neighbors might think that you're just really, really bad at this or that, you know, <laughs> like, come on, I've got to, like, somebody can help you make your yard look nicer. And it's like, no, no, that's what I'm trying to do. And so I think borders help with that. I think talking to your neighbors about what you're trying to do, you know, the different species and why you're excited about them helps. And you can even buy signs that'll say things like native wildflower <clears throat> planting. So people know it's it's not an accident. I always tell my neighbors about what I'm planting, yeah. why and whatnot. And you know, they're they're also members of Friends of the Arboretum, so they're they know what I do, but even I have to have a conversation with them so they know what is being being put out. So um, I had some aspen trees in my house until last year and I had to cut them down. They had some our native birds started eating on the buds off because they tasted so good. Oh, and so I never could have leaves on my aspen trees because they all grew in the, the all, all the birds were in those those thuya that they have. So anyway, I put out uh, some oak trees to replace them in this past uh, month. And they're like, well, what oaks are these? And, and what are they going to do? Aren't oak trees like going to be like eat up our houses? I'm like, no, these are a 
a form that's more narrow and, and columnar. Yeah. So, and then they said, well, my dogs are going to eat the acorns, aren't they? And I said, well, maybe, maybe eventually they'll have a little bit of acorns. So I that's. I don't think it'll be bad for them right. either. And only if they're white oaks, right, not the right. red oaks, surely. Well, they, they are white oaks. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a mistake. I didn't think about acorns. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just put this in here because I think it can be, uh, you know, really, uh, like I showed those sunflowers earlier, right? You know, it takes a while sometimes for our, our native plantings to look good, like especially if you're seeding instead of planting large plants, there's going to be a few years of... Uh, of patchy growth there. Um, and so, you know, just having those conversations, I think helps. And then I think my last point was maintain your plants. Just because we're talking about effortless natives, um, I guess they still require some effort. So whether that's, you know, pruning your trees and shrubs when they need it, potentially mulching your trees, uh, watering in the event of, you know, droughts, um, fertilizing. Mm -hmm. Some of you'll get some benefit in terms of flowering from that for some of them. For others, fertilizing is, is not a good idea. Um, but, you know, doing what you can to maintain them, uh, even though they're natives, that can go a long way. And then as promised, we have a section on shopping for native plants. Um, so this is one that I think is tricky because it's easy to talk about these native plants, but like, where do you find them? Because you can go to your large chain stores, and they are not necessarily going to carry uh, any of the species. Well, they'll carry some of the species we talked about today. Um, they might not be native genotypes of those species. They might be switchgrass that came from the Western US or coneflower that came from goodness knows where, you know, a, a cultivar. Occasionally, you might stumble into one of these and get really lucky and they'll just magically have a whole shipment of natives. Mm -hmm. um, Meyer, I think, had had an, oh, yeah. an initiative a few years back to have a native focused area in their in their garden center. And I which think was it's nice. awesome when they do. And I think like any building interest of native plants is fabulous because most people, when they go, they're gonna pick out what they see. And if it's native, all the better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think local independent retailers are really valuable for shopping for native species. Um, many of these, most of these, are going to have a whole native section. Are they going to have native, non-natives as well? For sure. Um, there are very few folks who exclusively do native species, although we'll, we can talk about them as well. And that's a real treat to go visit any of those places that specialize in natives, especially local genotypes, because not only can they tell you, you know, all about the species, but exactly where those seeds came from, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, but any of our local independent retailers are a fantastic source for native yeah. species. So in our area, there are several such entities. Uh, you know, we're part of Extension here, so we cannot recommend one company or another. Uh, that's not what we're allowed to do with the University of Kentucky or Extension. So I unfortunately can't start rattling off names. But if you go on Google, you search Native Plant Nursery Cincinnati, the ones that are out there will, will pop right up. And uh, or if you're from, you know, outside the Cincinnati area, if you're in Lexington, you can search for that. And there's a couple, there's a real nice nursery that has all kinds of horticultural stuff. It has a very specific native plant nursery inside the main nursery. And so that sort of stuff exists more and more, I think. The whole gardening world and the uh, horticultural world is really opening up to more and more native use, and they're all trying to do more to sell more native plants. Uh, even the giant wholesalers like across the street, um, actually it's that way, Amma Nursery is trying to do more and more native plants. They're, they're a larger operation, so it's taking longer to get built up to speed. The smaller nurseries can react more quickly, so the large wholesalers are definitely trying to do more and more native plants. I think you would be shocked at some of the native opportunities they have at Ammon now. Uh, some of the big leaf magnolias. Oh, they have big leaf Though they have big leaf magnolia, umbrella magnolia, ashii, magnolia oh, ashii. Yes, yeah, yeah, so last year they did. So, 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 so once <laughs> you, you get the bug, right? It's a whole thing. And, uh -huh. and it, it's, it's kind of, in my mind, a little different from other, I mean, and not, not every type of gardening, but you don't just go to the store and see what they have, right? You're like looking through mm -hmm. and reading yep. about it and researching and looking for the places that have yeah. these different native species that you're interested in. So to be fair, like Natorp is the other big wholesaler in the Cincinnati area. They also are doing the same thing. So you can go on both of their websites uh, as a uh, you know public uh, residential customer and you can see their availability. And you, if you start knowing what you're wanting, then that helps you have the power to go to different nurseries and select what they might have. 
And you know, if you know you want a Magnolia macrophylla, then you can go search for it on their website. And most everybody now has online availability uh, so that you don't have to you know, waste a trip out there, look around and not find it and come back. So that's another tip. And you can also tip. go visit um, nurseries that specialize in native plants um, and see what they have and talk with them. And they are super knowledgeable. And um, many times, uh, especially if they're a smaller scale or local operation, you might have to order in advance like look at what they think that they'll carry and place that order and then they'll get them to you. But I found them to be very reasonably priced and have excellent stock. Um, and again, I'm an employee of the University of Kentucky. I cannot recommend any individual location, but <laughs> if you go to the Kentucky Native Plant Society, what you'll find is an entire page of native plant suppliers and service providers. Fantastic resource right here. Um, and if you just Google, you know, Kentucky Native Plants, you'll find them great group, great newsletter, Facebook group, but also this resource, you can scroll down and find uh, nurseries. And they also kind of um, have a little warning <laughs> on them, which is nice. You know, this nursery sells plants that are known to be invasive, but they also sell native. So you can kind of get some sense of, is this a nursery that specializes in native plants? Do they have native plants, but also non-natives and invasives? Um, are they a nursery? And there are some, and it's a treat to get to go visit them that just use local genotypes, so locally collected seed. Um, so do they, do they notate or separate them at all by region? Because Kentucky, like you started out saying, Kentucky's yeah. very different. Yeah, I think <laughs> that they list the location of them there. So you could check um, by region. And I can say that um, in most parts of the state, uh, there are nurseries that specialize in native plants, but you, it's, a, it's a bit of a drive. Like the closest one for me is going to be uh, a, a couple hours, um, an hour or some change. But there are many local retailers that um, carry natives and source them from you know, either themselves or other nurseries. Um, just because that's not all that they do, I still think it's really valuable to support, you know, them wanting to carry native species because the more demand they get for them, the more native species they're going to carry. Right. Um, so, yeah. And that's why you see all these other nurseries starting to increase mm -hmm. what they have. has a farm, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Boyer Farm, yeah. Yep. Since they're not really a nursery, we can talk about Boyer. Boyer is fantastic. They uh, <laughs> take seed. We supply seed to Boyer Farm. Um, we supply seed to the Cincinnati Zoo, which has the Boyer Farm. So they uh, grow plants up there, all sorts of native stuff. Um, you know, last year we gave them lots of Carolina buckthorn. So Boyer Farm will have Carolina buckthorn that came from the Arboretum, which was given to us by a Western Boone County farmer about 12 years ago. He said, hey, do you need some Carolina buckthorn? I'm like, yes, where did you get, the, get this? And he was like, oh, that's on my farm out in Western Boone County. I'm like, what? So I have a local genotype. Carolina buckthorn. I love buckthorn. That could be the, uh, Carolina buckthorn. Yes. Not all buckthorn. The there are plenty of invasive buckthorns I do not want here. Carolina buckthorn. I it's outstanding. It is. Um, and you can get it more as a shrub, more as a tree. Lovely. Maybe, maybe we'll go see some. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So hopefully that kind of covered some ground there in terms of you know, ID, where to find them, ideas about them. Oh, another great place to order them from is from your state nurseries or state nurseries. We mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier. You have to order in the fall because they run out of stuff. Uh, they have bare root seedlings, which is a great way to get them. They're easy to plant. They're light. They have good root systems, typically locally collected seed. And uh, when you're getting bare root seedlings, it's like a dollar a seedling or $2 a seedling. Now you have to buy a lot of them but a great, great uh, resource there. Um, so if you want ideas about plants, no better place to go than the Arboretum. So we should probably get over there <laughs> yeah. and look at some favorite natives and some tricky situations.